My name is Kevin Anikowski, and this episode is on biological aspects of cognition and sleep. So first, let's talk about the biological aspects of cognition. It's going to be brief. So first, type-type or mind-brain identity theory states that mental states and ideas, such as moods or objects, are a result of specific neurological brain states. This is to say experiences are brain processes and not just partly unique brain activity. So type-type identity theory means our brains are creating engrams, which are physical alterations from stimuli, which creates then memories, maybe from long-term potentiation or its opposite, the synaptic long-term depression. More on biological cognition in later episodes. Like I said, this part was brief, so now let's get to sleep. Dream processes are reasonably high yield. First, let's discuss the different theories behind dreams. Freud argued that they are a sign of wish fulfillment. That would explain why more men than women report dreaming about sex with occasional evidence in both sexes upon waking up. Now, Freud went on to say that there is a manifest and latent content, which means what is seen in the dream, the manifest content, and what is meant by the dream, the latent content. Both are characteristics of dreams. Next, problem-solving dream theory, which Adler suggested, is exactly how it sounds. Dreams are attempts to solve problems during daily life, that is, problem-solving dream theory. The activation synthesis theory is another high-yield theory, arguing dreams are a result of activity in the brain and an attempt of the brain to understand what that activity means, though it by no way implies that dreams are useless. More recently, the activation synthesis model was more or less adjusted to make dreams more meaningful. In 2004, Zhang developed the continual activation theory, which stated dreaming is the timeline when working memory is processed into long-term memories because, as Zhang believed, continual activation of those areas of the brain are necessary for function, and thus you must maintain function continually while sleeping. It's a very interesting notion that the brain cannot turn off some areas or it might have bad consequences. Now for the stages. First, the progression of brain waves is beta, alpha, theta, and lastly, delta. You can often use BAT-D as a mnemonic to memorize this. To simplify, this is saying that the frequency is infinity to 12, 12 to 8, 8 to 4, and 4 to 0 hertz for each of the respective waves. So basically, all you're doing is dropping by 4 hertz each time. Now, the stages go from REM, or rapid eye movement, to non-REM 1 through 3. There used to be four non-REM stages, but three and four have been since grouped. REM involves predominantly alpha waves with dreams and is often called paradoxical sleep because of the similar wave state to waking hours, which is likely a partial explanation of dreams, and because your body is partially paralyzed. Non-REM 1 is the phase of falling asleep. Thus, it involves beginning the theta waves and disappearance of alpha waves. At this point, you could have hypnopompic and hypnagogic hallucinations, which is p popping up for hypnopompic or g going to bed for hypnagogic. Non-REM 2 involves predominantly theta waves. Stage 2 also has sleep spindles and K complexes on the EEG. Think two things in stage 2. But their exact cause is unknown. Recently, a study showed that they positively correlate with learning ability, while others have suggested they dampen outside stimuli, but it's still unknown. Stage 3 consists of delta waves and is the location of sleepwalking, called somnambulism, and also night terrors. Lastly to mention is the progression. Normally, the stages goes from non-REM 1, non-REM 2, non-REM 3, and then back up, non-REM 2, and then jumps to REM, and then it just repeats the non-REM 2, 3, 2, REM a couple times. So 2, 3, 2, REM, 2, 3, 2, REM. And then eventually back up to REM 1 and you wake up. It's important to note that while sleeping, you have an altradium rhythm, which is present during the day. The altradium rhythm is fluctuations of the brain waves and it's usually in 90 to 120 minutes for the average person. If you're trying to understand someone's altradium rhythm, you would want to use polysomnography a machine which records movements, heart rate, brain waves, etc. while sleeping. There is also circadian rhythms, which are fluctuations dependent on the 24-hour period, 
not the shorter period like ultradium rhythm. And that's the end of the episode.